wait, remember Stormhawks? I really think you do, as this has been one of the most requested videos I think I've ever had. It was a Cartoon Network and YTV collaboration project that was created by ASAF Ace Fibke that aired from 2007 to 2009 for two action-packed seasons. Stormhawks was a wildly fun and inventive series that took place in a fantasy world that was just so immersive and exciting, with a found family band of characters that are each so unique and interesting. The show had a lot to offer its audience. Unfortunately, it didn't really get a fair shot to shine in the spotlight before its abrupt demise. At its core, Stormhawks is a constant struggle for every character. The struggle to do good, the struggle to survive. Every character has their own motivations and development. We see our main characters prevail and their heroes fall. We experience what raw power at the hands of the evil Cyclonians can do, and how that power can corrupt anyone. There's just so much to unpack and so much to wrap your head around. I know it was a lot for me at first, as watching this series was actually my first experience with the show. It was a natural transition for me to check this show out after looking through Slug Terra, but I had a lot of fun with it and I'm excited to get into what made the show so strong. So if you enjoy the video, you better subscribe. Let's take flight into the world of Stormhawks. All hope lost. Until now. Our setting is the fantastical world of Atmos. Right off the bat, it is a similar concept to the world building of Slug Terra, but honestly, a bit more visually understandable. Atmos mainly consists of large plateaus of land, sort of like giant mesas that are known as terras. Below those towering mesas is the Nono Land. In Slug Terra, we call it the Dark Caverns, but in Stormhawks, it's known as the Wastelands. This lends itself to a simple ongoing sentiment from our heroes when they're fighting in the air. Uh, don't fall. The fire Fiery wastelands are incredibly dangerous and filled with monstrous creatures. As a result, the main method of travel from one terra to another would have to be flight. Everything from airships to weapons are reliant on these magically powerful crystals that create energy and come in many different flavors. Some have specific uses. For example, there are speed advantages with the velocity crystal. The burner crystal emits light. And there's a cheese crystal that turns things into cheese. What I wouldn't give for that. Other crystals are just highly rare and powerful, so they're highly sought after, like the Aurora Stone, Infinity Stone, and the Helix Crystal. Not that I want to spend the whole video comparing this to Slug Terra, but from my experience from one show to the other, this, at least in my mind, points to the slugs and their powers in that show. There's a lot of familiar concepts at a base level here that make it a lot easier to enter this world, being familiar with those structures, so I'd say it's quite the positive thing going into Stormhawks. Visually, I'm on board. Story-wise, I'm invested, and character-wise, I care. The main characters of Stormhawks are Arrow, Piper, Junko, Finn, Stork, and Radar. The series starts off with our gang of heroes battling our main antagonistic force in an action-packed two-parter. We learn most of what we need to in the intro. Their enemies are the Cyclonians, but more specifically, their evil ruler named Master Cyclonus. In the intro, we learn of the backstory that includes a gang of established Sky Knights, who would patrol the skies on their transforming motorcycle ships called Skimmers. The Knights were betrayed by one of their own, Dark Ace, who joined forces with Master Cyclonus and defeated them. But like I said, our story lies with our five main characters many years later. The mantle of Master Cyclonus has been taken up by her granddaughter, who proves to be just as maniacal as her grandmother, and decides to use her influence, followers, and nuclear-grade crystal-powered weapons to destroy as many Terras and Atmos as she can. Just evil people doing evil people things. We love to see it. Oh, crud. My name's Arrow, and I'm a Sky Knight. Take to the sky with Arrow Skimmer 3 Ultra! The leader of the gang is Arrow, voiced by Sam Vincent, who also voices Eli Shane, the protagonist of Slug Terra. See? The comparisons just compare themselves, but again, this is a good thing. I see this as an absolute win. Arrow is a young redhead who sports a traditional heroic personality, with a strong bloodline connection to one of the original Sky Knights that were defeated years prior. It's funny how they call him the last descendant of Lightning Strike, when the series only takes place 10 years after their defeat. Like just say dad. It's not like he was a distant ancestor or anything, but either way, his bloodline and strong moral compass have paved the way for him to be a traditional leader. Arrow is also very talented at flying and in air combat, as he doesn't hesitate to take risks in order to do what needs to be done. Also, because Dark Ace is thought to have killed Sky Knight Lightning Strike, it makes sense that they would have such a strong connection and hatred towards one another, the whole Inigo Montoya complex and all. Next, we have Piper, voiced by Chiarazani. Piper is by far an essential 
member of the team. As a crystal specialist, she is able to use and refine crystals so that the team has energy to power their vehicles and weapons, and of course, charcuterie. Man, I just want them cheese powers. She also proves to be essential to the team in her meticulously thought out plans, although they ignore her most of the time anyway in improv. And if science, magic, and strategy wasn't enough, she also is a uniquely skilled fighter, having mastered the martial art called Sky Fu. Personality-wise, she is particular and opinionated at the same time. Oh, and I forgot this too, towards the second half of the last season, a huge reveal is made emphasizing that Piper is actually more of the Chosen One figure than Arrow, which I am curious how that played out for fans back when this originally premiered. I think it's cool how it's portrayed, I just did not see it coming at first. Finn is another member of the group, voiced by Matt Hill. Finn serves as the comic relief. He is distracted often by women, same, and can be lazy, arrogant, and prone to lying. But he also has extremely precise aim, making him valuable to the team due to his sharpshooting skills. What he lacks in personality, he makes up for in scopes. But in reality, he does balance out the team and provides an extremely flawed character that occasionally learns from his mistakes, and is still astonishingly loyal to the group. After all, when the team is constantly faced with so many of their idols and allies siding with the Cyclonians, for different reasons including money, fame, and their livelihoods and more, Finn wouldn't do any of those things. His heart is always in the right place. Junko is the engineer of the group, voiced by Colin Murdoch. Junko is actually not human like Arrow, Piper, and Finn. He is a wallop, a species that is kind of like a rhino, known for his strength but is also stereotyped as low intelligence. While Junko is strong, breaks the stereotypes as he is definitely intelligent, he's at least smarter than me. I don't know the first thing about aircraft mechanics. All I know is that plane go, Neow. Personality wise, he fits into the gentle giant trope, being a very sensitive and warm guy. He also tends to be extremely timid, lacking confidence in himself. Stork is also another non-human member of the group. He is voiced by Scott McNeil and is the pilot of their ship, the Condor. He is of the Merb species. His personality is quickly established as paranoid and doom-pilled. A lot of these traits could be traced to his original Terra as Merbia is known for its constantly occurring natural disasters that would obviously require any inhabitants to be hyper aware of their surroundings. It could also be thanks to the number of years spent trying to survive in the wastelands. He is the smartest out of the whole group with an incredible memory and is also recognized for his inventions that are proven to be incredibly useful in saving lives. Although Stork can be seen as cowardly in many instances, his character actually tends to change over the course of the series, and he becomes more confident and proves that you can be both afraid and selfless at the same time. Radar is the last member of the group. He is non-verbal, but when he does make noise, those sounds are provided by Ace himself. Radar is kind of a cross between a rabbit or a lemur, but seems to have more emotional intelligence than being just a pet. He is the group's official vibe checker, knowing immediately whether or not someone poses a threat to the group. He's also Arrow's co-pilot and seems to be bonded with Arrow the most out of anyone in the group. Originally, he was found by Arrow seven to eight years prior, and the two of them have been together ever since. Arrow also grew up alongside Piper and Finn, and the three of them didn't meet Junko until later on, when they were defending their fortress from a Cyclonian youth brigade, which included Junko. He decided to change sides and join the rest of the group to reform the Stormhawks after Arrow was told it was his destiny to reform them. They traveled to the Wasteland to retrieve the old Stormhawks Condor ship, which was at the time currently housing Stork, who was taking refuge when his home was attacked by Cyclonians. And so the team was formed. The series developed from one of Ace's past show ideas revolving around two concepts. One, one, transforming flying motorcycles, and two, the fighters on those vehicles that Ace dubs the Sky Knights. These thoughts were then developed into the series we know today, with the next step being creation of the characters. Ace specifies that each character is actually just versions of himself as a kid, or of kids that he knew growing up. At their core, they were all just struggling for something. For Arrow, it was the struggle to do the right thing. Junko is struggling with confidence, Finn is struggling to be humble, Piper struggles to be patient, and Stork is just struggling to survive. From start to finish, Ace estimates that it would take around four to four and a half months to complete a single episode. They were expected to deliver a show every two weeks, and at any given time, the creative team was working on around six episodes at once. This shorter animation production time could be thanks to the unique style, shared with other shows animated by his company, Nerdcore, like Slugterra and Hot Wheels Battle Force 5. As I talked about in my Slugterra video, Nerdcore was founded in 2002 by Ace and Chuck Johnson after leaving a larger animation company. The 
company was later acquired by DHX Entertainment, which later rebranded as Wild Brain. The animation is mainly CG, but in Stormhawks, we get a bit more detailing that really makes it look unique. It's thanks to both a fusion of CG and 2D animation, which Ace calls blockbuster Saturday morning animation. He says that it still has that feeling of a television show, but with all the fancy additions and finishing that they could give it. And it is not only unique, but it actually does look good. I already praised the style in my Slug Terra video, and I have to say that it also does a good job in making CG not feel too aggressively CG. It also allows the series to show off the landscapes and the settings that the characters are in, which is essential in trying to immerse your viewer in a fantasy world. Stormhawks does an amazing job at showing off the world that they have built. If anything in the series falls flat, it most definitely would not be that. I like details, but when you have too many details, it... <laughs> Transform into bike boat and ride! ride. Something that the series boasts is a very diverse age demographic. Ace mentioned that it's thanks to the sophisticated stories that they would try and tell. He says they are not super formulaic and are stories that the creative team themselves would be interested in following as adults. While the series still includes the visual gags and super action-packed sequences for thrill-seeking younger kids, they also put heavy emphasis on well-rounded characters that really drive the heart of the show. For the most part, I kind of agree. The characters do have extremely interesting and unique backgrounds, which shapes their characters in the show as the story moves along. But in general, a lot of this potential is overlooked or thrown away. The strongest episodes in the series are the ones which focus on the actual furthering of the plot, but for me, those episodes were too few and far between. The second half of the second season is well regarded as the most engaging portion of the series, really digging into the larger continuing plot, not necessarily obsessing over small filler episodes. But overall, I think the show is pretty great, but its biggest flaw is that it's left with so much potential, that's the word I want to use, because it did build a tangible world, something that took its time to develop and felt lived in. And onto that, the action in the show being top notch and having a heavy focus on delivering a lot of entertainment through that. I personally love the creatures and the monsters we find throughout the land. They feel creative and most times terrifying to take head on. The world is just so cool to see, something I think Ace and the team he worked with are great at doing for their shows. They always emphasize the world world around them, from the designs of the world to the creatures that fill it. It has the progression of a video game, building up this team, working towards your goal, but still having these standalone side moments that would take the front seat where the main story wouldn't come back into play until later when it needed to start heating up again, which I think played into people starting to turn away from the series as season two would start really pushing the story harder, starting to give you answers and a lot of understanding of the world would come to light, which can be a lot to ask for if the first season was most anything but that. Unfortunately, right as it seemed as the story was starting to fully kick off in the second season, we're built up with this giant plot, the final battle, something incredible was about to happen, and it was left on a gigantic cliffhanger because it was cancelled. The last episode aired in April of 2009, and we know that it was not necessarily planned out by Ace or the creative team. In an interview in 2007, Ace mentions that the series has been ordered for a total of 52 episodes, and that he has plans to continue the series past that point. He was mainly talking in the form of a couple feature-length episodes after the initial 52, most likely detailing the ensuing fight against Master Cyclonus after the team follows her into the far side. How chilling. I feel like Stormhawks has a lot to offer in terms of storytelling and world building. It was able to establish some really solid foundations that we were just getting to build upon before its abrupt end. I will argue that it could have used its time better, but despite that, it absolutely deserved more room to grow and thrive. I just loved the concept concept of Terra's and the Wasteland. Although villain motivations are pretty simple and black and white, the motivations of our heroes are established so well. Each character has flaws and room to grow that again, they just needed time for. So what happened to the series if Ace was planning on continuing it from the start? Well, Cartoon Network decided to not renew the series for a third season. Like I mentioned from Ace's interview in 2007, he was looking to extend the series beyond the TV series and create feature-length episodes of what I assume would be the 
Stormhawk's final battle with Master Cyclonus, but unfortunately, we don't know much more than that. It could be that it couldn't compete with other similar shows airing around the same time, like Avatar The Last Airbender, but again, we don't know that for sure. It may not have had enough support to continue on, even though there was a solid fan base. But shows on other networks were one thing. Dealing with how its own network in the States, Cartoon Network, was starting to become a different network for a while is another, from the live action era being this huge focus for them, as well as the cartoons that would birth from the other side of that, being in their own wheelhouse and their rise sweeping over. The cartoon world can be cutthroat to get a nice and supportive audience for your show, but it gets harder when everything that truly took away viewership opportunities was all mainly on your same network. They were planning on further expansions of the Stormhawks brand as there was a game that was in development called Stormhawks Sky Race, which was an MMO RPG that allowed the player to build their own Sky Knight and personalize their armor, weapons, and vehicles. In the game, they would be allowed to fight against other players and compete in tournaments, receiving crystals and rewards. The game unfortunately never got out of beta, but fans were able to test out the beta version on the Nerdcore website, but the site was taken down after what we could assume was the company being absorbed into DHX Entertainment, now Wild Brain. In addition to that game, there were also some comics that were in development that unfortunately didn't go very far. There was one issue distributed at Toronto Anime Con in 2009 that featured one story. Technically, it was an Ashcan comic, which means that it was mainly created to establish copyright. While no more of the line of comics were created, there was a mini-comic titled Stormhawks The Escape that was a DVD exclusive when the first season was released on DVD. There was a merchandising promotional strategy in plan too. Originally to start in the spring of 2008, which included lots of toys, vehicles, action figures, collectibles, and more. And I'm not gonna lie, some of them look really, really cool. The series even had fast food toys because of course it did. The Stormhawks brand was going to have a lot to offer. The creators clearly had a strong plan for all of it and had a lot of passion behind it. Similar to Slug Terra, they could go the way of the show now, which on YouTube has come back in the form of shorts, continuing parts of the stories post the show ending, which has garnered some attention. So it may be a cool avenue to take Stormhawks as well, bake it into the online ecosystem and garner the fans back around another ride in the sky to finish what was started. One thing I hate is when a cartoon cannot wrap up its story and you're left on this incredible cliffhanger. And unfortunately, Stormhawks falls into that category of a lot of buildup, a really cool cliffhanger, and no closure. So despite not having a satisfying ending to the series, the fandom still lives on. And these fans that are online are still very active, campaigning for the series to make a comeback or to just get people into it. So keep fighting, Sky Knights. You never know what is possible in this day and age. Would you like to see Stormhawks come back in some shape or form? And what were some of your favorite parts of the series? Let me know in the comments. Thanks so much for watching. Like and subscribe. Later.